Retroactively defining a team as a super team based on how much they've won or their results is wrong, boo, and is an insult to the five players that tried to get together to become greater than the sum of their parts. If you look back in early days basketball where the term came from, there are super teams going all the way back to the 60s. Now, of course, because the salary cap has gone up and because the word has sort of penetrated the sports fans zeitgeist and people are now using it in esports as well as sports, we talk about it more. The most famous example of this that I think is in more recent memory is the Miami Heat signing LeBron James and Chris Bosh to join Dwayne Wade in order to form the big three. And there is some debate about whether or not the big three and the Miami Heat lived up to the expectations in their championship window in four years winning two championships. But there is no debate that this was a super team. And so that tells you almost all you need to know, that a super team is not based on the results or the outcome of the roster, but instead the magnitude of the signings and the expectations of the roster. Now, there isn't a unilaterally agreed on definition of the term super team, but just like watching a video of two adults in fursuits making love, you don't have to splooch to know that it was porn. Sometimes it's porn whether you like it or not. And in that same analogy, 2017 phase are the perfect example of furry. I mean, a super team in CS. Now, if we look at another modern ball example, you have Golden State stealing away Kevin Durant from OKC because he said, you can't beat him, join him. As Easy Money Sniper went to Golden State to help them become the super team that would indeed be dominant and certainly was a very criticized, I think very rooted against move because of the stature of the lineup and it just felt like cheating, you know what I mean? I think that was the ultimate feeling that I think I wanna tap into here, that sometimes super teams feel like cheating and sometimes there's an inverse correlation between how much people like the team and how much they're expected to win, right? With super teams, the expectations are almost always astronomical. Like, I think Braun was like, yeah, we're going to win six, seven, eight rings with this lineup when he went into the Miami Heat. And uh, that's because they know what they were doing, that it makes sense on paper. Super teams always make sense on paper. And in the case of FaZe, you had Olaf and Guardian coming in to help out Nico, to help out Kerrigan, to help out Rain, to make FaZe as strong as they possibly could be with just pure money. And that's another reason why people hate super teams. It's the money involved. You know what I mean? It's, it's the opposite of money ball right when you watch moneyball it's a heartwarming story about underdogs that make the most bang for your buck right like every time when you were a little kid and your mom gave you five cents to go to the store to buy hubba bubba one piece to enjoy it for the whole day you really understood the value of a dollar but in today's modern game of increasing salary caps and golden state warriors and phase clan and all of these people just buying out all your favorite players all the time frozen getting stolen away ripped out of the hands of mouse for a phase even though he was no problem <coughs> Oh, it just makes me so angry when I think about sometimes the signings that take place, but at the same time, it's sweet when it works. Now, you know, a team that people don't hate is Aesone, baby. Launders 10 for 10% off, the best CS2 headphones on the market. They're a team of Danish engineers who are incredibly intelligent, making the best headphones. And again, I say for CS2 because they're, they're Danish, they designed for CS2, and they get CS players in the office to make sure their shit works. So, Astralis, they won't be there in top eight on the stage. Okay, but Aesone will. So if you're looking to cheer for someone, cheer for Aesone, Launch 10 in the description below. Oh, also on Amazon Prime in North America, baby. I didn't have that much coffee. I don't know why I'm yapping so much. <clears throat> but while I'm yapping, I just figured I would talk about Boxer, baby, because the BoxerMovement.club is, is real. We're going to do Launders Land 2 coming up. And if you're here, you can come by and buy some Boxer merch from me in person. But if you're at home, we got a website, BoxerMovement.club. Look at all this glorious clothing, baby. And you can go ahead and be the owner of some official Astralis hate merch. Uh, Super Team Hate merch, uh, Movement Club merch, F1 starting up again. All right, get yourself some racing flags. Boxer Movement Club, baby. And I want to say, a Super Team in the hands of Kerrigan is always one in good hands, right? Like if we, we think about Kerrigan, I think one thing that's really cool about FaZe Clan is that you have that period of time up until the Boston Major, which is the greatest major in history. I mean, I, I like when Glaive won, you know, Atlanta 2017. It's my personal favorite. But Kerrigan, obviously, losing to Cloud9 at Boston, hey, we needed that. Thinking back now that CSGO is finished and all of CS history is behind us and we've only won one major in the history of everything, yeah, we needed that. But up until that point, FaZe Clan were cleaning up. 
Cloud9 were ranked six when that final rolled around. FaZe Clan were the number one team in the world. This machine was rolling. Kerrigan was doing a great job as an IGL. Nico was a star. Every single player on that team was achieving individual heights, but they were farming. They were terrifying. They were everything you wanted them to be as a super team. It made perfect sense. And I think that the reason that they fail is not because it's a stupid team retroactively on paper. It's simply because Kerrigan has a choking problem at the time, right? So in 2017, this was the big narrative. And I think it actually speaks to the fact that super teams can't be bought unless you also buy the IGL. And I think for a lot of fans these days who maybe are not familiar with what a super team should mean, they have always just said, well, the teams that won the most are super teams. I just think it's important to get this definition correct because it identifies a very specific type of team. Win or lose, a team could have been a super team because they were built to become this team. When Cold Zero went to phase, it's another player who is in and around their prime, maybe near the tail end, but still thought of as one of the best players of all time who could definitely still have it to come onto the lineup. But there was no Kerrigan on this lineup when Cold Zero joined. But the idea of it being a super team was still there. I mean, they were still loaded up and buying up the best players that you could. And especially now breaking down the borders in terms of regions, like they were really showing exactly how much power money has. And there's no one that's truly a fan of that unless you're just a FaZe fan, right? If you're a fan of the game, you're like, come on, man. Why, why wouldn't it be more even playing field of just like the team that got good? Because what happens is you, you can be a great team with even some money, but if there is just a like a, a lineup with just so much investment background, of course, you know, the phase on the stock market, of course, not, not doing too good right now, but they just got so much money that they can literally just buy the player they want. Then there's something about that 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 sucks as a fan, right? You're like, come on. But as I said, Kerrigan, it's always in good hands with him, right? Because he'll make finals with the new players. He'll easily get good with them. And I want to take this time to give Kerrigan so much credit for Brokey because Brokey comes in to FaZe Clan and within a few months, Brokey is already looking like a veteran tier one elite opera. For people who don't know, Brokey, as soon as he joined this team, was fantastic. And he is a player who basically came out of nowhere. When he joined FaZe, a lot of players were like, wait, what? But every single player before Brokey, it sort of made sense. But Brokey was the one who always had the excuse of being a rookie that maybe wouldn't have made it, right? Talking about rookies. They could all fail in tier one. But Kerrigan is so goddamn good at teaching and making the most of his teams that, of course, this current phase lineup ends up working. The final piece being ROPS, right? That's like the Kevin Durant to the modern new phase is ROPS coming in right after Twist. And this is solidifying phase as like the shining example of a super team that just keeps on buying and keeps on working, right? They have periods of downturn and upswing and Kerrigan coming in and out, but Clearly when he's on and they get those superstars in and they pay as much as they need to, Kerrigan runs the best international team that we've ever seen. Now, if we talk about Astralis as an example of a team that Vu has brought up, well, Astralis are a super team because they won a lot. It's like, okay, was Dignitas a super team because they had the core of Device and Dupree and Zipix? No, of course not. Now, these players were good and Device was a superstar before and after all the way through the game in terms of every single year he's played. Best Danish player of all time, one of the best offers of all time, and one of the most consistent players of all time with the most longevity. But he was the one, right? He, that's not super team. That was like really good Danish lineup. It was powerhouse device with Dupree, who was flirting, flirting with top 20, getting in there. Zipix, who was the 20th best player in 2013, who only ever broke in and got into the top 20 properly when Glaive took over. And this is the key point for me, that this is the very clear divide between Astralis being a super team and not because four out of five players that you would consider stars or superstars today at the time of Astralis when they were in their reign of dominance in 2018 were already on the team before when they were losing right before 2017 it was Kerrigan who was calling for the team the change that made them work was not a superstar signing it was the IGL, who just came over from Heroic. Then they went on to win four majors in total. He won the first one with Kirby. Then they won with Majisk. And Majisk was also a great signing to replace Kirby, but they didn't even want to lose Kirby in to begin with. And this sort of brings up another point that they got maybe the best Danish core that you could ask for before Glaive had joined the team, before Kerrigan had come in. And But they were getting quartered a lot. They were definitely having a choking problem. They were no super team. They weren't a super team because they didn't join up while also having tons of trophies behind them or individual accolades outside of just device. So what a good example of a super team would have been post 2018 would be after a couple of majors. If any of the five players on Astralis 
decided to, let's say two of them move to the other Danish lineup or join phase to make a Danish core with Kerrigan. That would have been super team signings because they had their individual accolades up and their trophies behind them. And there's also, I wanna say the perception and expectation is just so massive when we talk about this, right? And when we talk about the phase signings in history, that's such a big deal here is everyone expected them to win so much. I mean, look at Navi in, in 2018. They had a stronger pair than Astralis had at the top. They had Simple in, at number one and Electronic at number four. They were not considered a super team because they were already, first of all, already building their brand, playing together. The rest of the team was not quite strong enough. It, it needs to feel like a cheat code. It really does. It really needs to feel like a cheat code that you bring someone in to like overwhelm the odds, you know, to, to help you win. And Navi did not have enough uh, between two people who are very strong, but not quite enough, right? That's not a super team. When Bit comes into the team in 2021, Na'Vi have a reign of terror for themselves. And even though there is no era, in my opinion, for Na'Vi, in 2021, as it was going on, it felt like an era was happening, but it was too short. It didn't feel like it. The Na'Vi area overall, 2021 was such a recovery year where half the year was online, half the year was on land. Bit was technically the superstar signing, right? He was a very impressive player to get onto the team, but he came in from the Academy League. He was not even the modesty of the Academy League, so you couldn't even have that sort of level. But they made the most of him under Blade, which I think was the key thing. But this was not a super team in that sort of classical sense. And if we go back in history a little farther, I think there's something unique about Counter-Strike that we can not compare to a game like basketball where there's super teams coming out of the 60s where, you know, you have NIP. Could they have been considered a super team? I think actually there is some kind of weird argument where they're a super team because they were formed as players who were the best at Source and 1.6 in Sweden to join forces to take over to guarantee success at the beginning of CSGO. And in the beginning of CSGO 2013, NIP have an era. They have 87 and 0 on the land streak. But at the genesis of the game, we don't really have this rhetoric. This is even before the heat or right around the same time. So this, the idea of a super team is not even has not even really penetrated the consciousness of the esports fan. But there technically is sort of an argument that even though they came from different iterations of the game, Freiburg from Source and Forest and Garrett from 1.6, because they were so good at those games, and then they did end up succeeding, like kind of in a sense they were, but maybe it was impossible to say that you could really forecast the dominance and that there was very games that were right there that also could have that argument um, with uh, uh, with existence, <laughs> with existence, uh, you know, known as the best source caller. And I, I don't have that much source knowledge, sorry, but uh, Very Games were right alongside Nip playing near, very competitive against them at the beginning of CSGO. Maybe they could have been considered a super team that failed, but there's always been a weird thing in the French shuffle where almost never at the same time have you had the possible strongest French lineup all at once, literally until 2017, blow, G2, the, the French super team, right? This is the team that Shox is calling for, okay? Now this is another key thing again, you have the wrong caller. Shox as a caller doesn't work here, but you have Kenny S, NBK on this team, you have Shox on this team, Apex, like this team is hard as hell. This is supposed to make sense. And this is G2, one of the big players, as we would see as the years rolled on, that would end up making massive signings and spending money to build the best possible teams. And uh, this was one of the early examples and attempts at a super team. And it had the stature and the expectations to try to get there. But looking back, that one seemed more clearly like an attempt to bring the French revival, right? To create the resistance. Uh, but the baguette was stale and nobody wanted to have a bite. And that's why uh, a great IGL is important no matter how many players that you buy. And there is also an interesting phenomenon where talent normalizes. When you get all of the superstars together, there was always somebody who lacked space. There was a vacuum of space on every CS team and you cannot deny that it's like the law of thermodynamics you just cannot deny it okay how many ct positions and how many t positions and what maps you get to play and everything there's always going to be somebody who suffers as soon as you get to the third guy when you have that many great players
Astralis were the only real example of their stats being so good that they were able to also sort of squeeze in enough performances that they could all get into top 20 because of how dominant, how many tournaments they won. But again, that's the funny part is that there's never been a super team to do that, right? And we talk about some of the biggest eras in the game. It's never been super teams. In fact, I always say this about Kerrigan, but he's never defended an era. And that's the one thing that he doesn't have. When you go back to Fnatic, okay, <laughs> go back to Fnatic after Nip, they start beating out Nip in grand finals at majors two of them in fact and nip actually played in five major finals they only won one in 2014 there was a world where nip don't win a major final when you see get right crying on the stage i swear it's because they nearly missed out on their championship window because Fnatic stole their first major in 2013 at DreamHack Winter and Flusha. That's why he has three because he was on that original Fnatic lineup. And then you move forward uh, and then they win, go on to win two more with this Crims Olaf Flusha combo that is just so perfect. And that's another example of, well, not a super team because there's still just one or two years after CSGO has come out. We are still learning about, like Olaf going to phase is a superstar signing because of the resume that he built up. And in that Fnatic era, Olaf just has so much impact on the meta of the game in a way that sort of transcends what players could do at the time. As a rifler, he had more spots named after him than I could even think about for anybody else, right? Like he had Olaf on cobblestone uh, at the end of long B where you would throw the lurk smoke and jump out. Then you have Olaf Meister when you jump out on train right out of T-Con in that corner where you sit and wait in defaults. These positions are like two of the key, most key positions in the entire map pool. And he has both of them, right? So if you guys want to know how good Olaf was, he was a monster. So, but that was him in the Fnatic era. And now we can get in that time machine one more time. All the way to the future because we are coming up into the modern era where everybody is using Super Team all the time. People are going back like Vu and talking about Super Teams in history that never really happened and discrediting players who got together to try to make a gestalt, which is to become greater than the sum of your parts and instead just call them a Super Team and say they bought their success when they really didn't. And uh, yeah, Vu, come on, man, get it together. You got to give these players some credit and stop rewriting history because it doesn't happen like that. But when we talk about now, we talk about Astralis, okay? And Astralis today are a Super Team. Now, it is one of the weaker examples in terms of stature of players. Like you have Jabby and Stown coming into the team and they win a blast spring and fall final. And uh, Jabby for the first six months of 2023 is the best rifler in the world. And then Frozen slowly takes over from there. And then the rest of the year is not quite as impressive, but Stown and Jabby both make top 20. Stown has multiple appearances in the top 20. He was always the best planned player for Heroic. And yeah, he did have his flaws. Some big games, Stown has problems, but overall his consistency as a top 20 player, his position as the best player on Heroic was undeniable. And for Jabby and Stown, who are basically the two best players on Heroic to come over to Astralis, yeah. It's a super team at the very least. It's a Danish super team. And it's now it's a team that has four top 20 players. And people are like, how can you call this a super team? Because it failed. And I made this entire 30 minute video just to explain that because they failed has nothing to do with them being a super team. It also explains why they get hated so much. Now, there were enough people who doubted this to work because of the roles. So that's an out that Astralis have, I will say, with this new team. But I personally think that this IGL thing that I talked about with Kerrigan being such an important part of FaZe working and that on, one of the only examples of a super team working in history is something that needs to be brought and focused on, right? Like this new Astralis losing to their old IGL with zero top 20 players getting smashed 2-0 at the Katowice play-in and then losing 2-0 again for major qualification uh, when Glaive was forced to make a team as quickly in 12 hours and still beat out the Astralis super team like that shines a light on how important an IGL is so this recent Astralis is a great example of a team that uh, has completely failed and is also a super team and then the other one is Cloud9 who came together in the summer and they're a team I rated really highly I will still hold on to this I think I was wrong about Electronic as an IGL I believed in him he believed in himself and he has matured so much in his career he has been top player for so long but he's also eventually going to fall out of his prime maybe it is a good time to transpose into the igl role well maybe not i personally want to hold on to the idea that maybe if he stuck with it he could have gotten better it took apex a long time it does take deep people a long time to become great igls 
And also, I think that if Shiro had stuck around a little longer, that would have been helpful as well. I would have most, most of all, would have loved to see Shiro stay on the team with Boomich, who you can call a real IGL since he had one Stockholm, and see that through a little bit longer. But we have Cloud9, who technically aren't failing right now. They qualified to the major, actually playing some impressive CS. They still don't have like an opera, and they have Boomich, but now they're kind of in a liquid situation where they have a player who's like the nitro equivalent of an opera in a sense. His stats aren't that great. He's an IGL, but he's the opera that they need to use. And I guess Liquid are an example of a team that worked uh, with an opera who doesn't have the, the best stats ever, maybe had one other hybrid. I think the op changing hands like it does on Cloud9, it's never worked in history. I'm not betting on that changing all of a sudden. So yeah, here's a video that was supposed to be a vehicle for talking about super teams in history and just talking about some great teams in CSGO and CS2 and some of the conversations around the term. Let me know what you guys think and what your definition for the term super Super team really is for you and are there some teams that maybe i left out there's obviously liquid that definitely gave off super team vibes but that would have to be predicated on stewie joining the team and many of you wouldn't call stewie a superstar signing even though i would man because i think he's the most important player in north american history okay that's touchy and then there's also SK Luminosity days. Now, in the Brazilian scene, of course, picking up Cold Zero was what really made it, right? They had the Fur, FNX, Fallen, Combo, Core, and Taco. And then Cold Zero was so insanely powerful, but Cold Zero could not be predicted. And unbelievable stats and performances and became one of the best lurkers of all time and everything. So, you know, that could be thought about as a, as a Brazilian super team in terms of everyone perfectly complementing the positions, right IGL. Um, but I just don't know, I guess, enough about Brazilian history and the and the Brazilian scene to see if that's how it felt down there, if they were calling it that. But that is obviously also one of the great lineups in history that we love to talk about. But yeah, you let me know uh, what you think. If you've got more topics for me, also hit me up in the comments. I'm there reading, baby. The only reason I did this one is because I read your comments last time. All right. So be safe out there. Remember, you always have enough money for a deagle.